Hey, Grant. Hey. Nice what's seeing up? you, buddy. You too. Good. So, what's up? Uh, is, is this how we want to start it? Exactly. Uh, lots up. Buddy, um, you're doing so many different things, I don't even know where to start, so that's why I'm asking. Uh, should I introduce myself to begin Yeah, with? please, go okay. for it. So, uh, my name's Grant Blaisdell. Uh, I don't, I guess I tag myself as a creator more than anything. Uh, maybe I'm most known for co-founding, you know, some projects, especially around the blockchain space, uh, CoinFirm being one of them, which is a global leader in analytics and anti-money laundering for crypto. Uh, Copernic Space is a new venture I have, which is also uh, relates to blockchain technology. That's a marketplace for the space industry, mainly downstream space applications. Uh, I'm a musician and a producer as well. Um, I'm a founder. Can we start with a simple yeah. one? What is a creator? Yeah. Uh, the reason I use that term is because, you know, most people go like, I'm an artist or I'm a musician or, uh, but I, I view everything I do, whether it is a, a company or or music or whatever as form of creation. So that's why I, I tend to label myself as, as a creator. And that's what's most important to me and what drives me. I'm less driven you know, by titles or, you know, CEO or whatever like that, uh, you know, being a founder or a creator of something is, is vitally important to me. Very good. If you don't mind, uh, I think chronologically speaking, we can start with the blockchain part of yeah, that. Yeah, okay. So when did you exactly start working on the blockchain and uh, what was the first project? Um, you know, the, uh, knowing Bitcoin, I guess the first time I probably found out around about Bitcoin was, I don't know, maybe 2010-ish, 11. I was in California at the time uh, in the tech space, so, you know, I was privy to that sort of information. But I think everybody kind of, anybody who's really passionate or is creating around this technology, I think they have what, what I call their aha moment. Um, mine was because I was doing a lot of stuff around digital media, trying to figure out kind of innovative models and, and systems. Um, that that would reward creators better. Uh, there's always this issue of trusted third party. So in in the industry now, that's a YouTube, that's a Spotify, etc. And how you know we just have to trust them um, to be honest, truthful, that they have all the best systems practices in place. That what a creator is being rewarded for his creation is really what he should be rewarded with. Um, and blockchain kind of filled that void for me of helping solve one of these key issues in, in the digital media and, and space, music space specifically. Um, so that's, that's really how I got into it. That was probably around 2013-ish, 12-ish. My first, uh, my first projects were digital media focused. Um, I even, in Poland here, I had a joint venture with a, one, a big media company out here to actually kind of relaunch a legacy title of theirs digitally in English and start introducing some blockchain elements. That was probably about five, six years ago. Um, so way, way too early. You know, just now is, is even a time to consider things from a maturity of the technology, the market, et cetera. Um, so that was, that was really my, my first foray into it. Uh, not long after that, I met what would become my co-founders of CoinFirm and, you know, the rest is kind of, um, history around that. But, but at the end of the day, really, you know, my, my stuff around music and, and looking at models for creators is what got me into blockchain the most. I mean, we are recording right now in Warsaw, Poland, but, uh, I guess you're not, uh, you know, from here. So then, do you also want to go for the transition part of it? Uh, what, of coming here? Yeah, exactly. Because you started saying that it was in California. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. So, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm originally American, but my mother is from Warsaw. Um, so I was here in the nineties after communism fell, she brought really the American computer industry to, to central Eastern Europe after communism fell with Compaq. So I was here for a few years then. Um, and then later on in life, I was, I was getting kind of, uh, a little frustrated with the environment in California. Um, and I've always had a life mission along with my mother, uh, to, 
you know, Poland has an insane amount of intellectual capital, you know, great ideas, great tech people, cool, you know, cool startups in, in, in a lot of ways. But there's certain issues, both, you know, some of it's cultural, but another one is just kind of access to capital that American startups have and what terms they have on, on that capital. Um, so I kind of, I came here with, with this mission, you know, to show that you can build, you know, a startup out of here that's globally competitive or viewed as one of the best in the world at what it does. Um, and, you know, I've, I've kind of proven that model. And now, once again, being too early, you know, I, this is something I was trying to do seven years ago or so. Uh, and there's, there's even an article in one of the big uh, business publications out here uh, that talks about this mission like seven years ago. And they, you know, they kind of hinted at us being a little crazy. You know, but now that's what everyone's trying to do. They're trying to bring Western capital and Western uh, like practices around it uh, into into Poland and other markets in Central Eastern Europe. Um, so that was kind of my my transition. I mean, Poland's Poland's a great place when it comes to you know you're Iranian originally and you're here. So uh, Poland's a great place from a creative standpoint, in in my opinion. You know. Uh, and I'm from LA originally, and you know I I have no issue working with the people out here when it comes to music, right? Like so, uh, standards are really good here when it comes to that. But you do have to deal with you know the the struggles that do exist uh, on this market, and like I said, some of it's cultural. As an artist, which one of those struggles is hitting you you know hardest? Um. <coughs> That's an interesting question. Um, I would say, uh, you know, having to fight for things. I don't know how to how to really explain this, but um, it would be kind of like in the U.S. Usually, it's why yes first, and then why no last is like a side thing. Um, here, the attitude's a little flipped on that. Uh, so. It's, it, it bothers me less from the artist side, except for the sensitivity. It bothers me more from my, you know, my competency side or my, you know, kind of aggressive accomplishment side. I don't, you know, I like stuff to get done. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of, you got to remember this is a country that went through, you know, hell. And after that, it went through a different type of hell with 50, 50 years of communism. And that has had a long-term effect, even, you know, cross-generationally -gener uh, when it comes to certain mentalities and attitudes. Uh, Poles have a certain kind of negativity to them. Uh, I, I think I'm guilty of it as well. I think I have some of those qualities in myself. So you run into walls here, unnecessarily is what I'd say. You run into unnecessary walls. And for, for artistic-minded personalities, I think that can be emotionally tough. Let's just first start with the coin firm mm -hmm. because I think that's one of the main, let's just say, brands that people know you for. Yeah. So how did that start and uh, where did you go <laughs> after that? <laughs> well, like I said, a coin firm is analytics and, and anti-money laundering focused. Mm. And, um, you know, I don't come out of finance or that thing. So a lot of people have known me for a long time before I ever did. Uh, coin firm are kind of shocked a little bit, you know, and if you know me as a person, I don't come off as, as uh, someone who would create a company like that. Um, but I, I think I've always had a, a certain capability to very quickly understand and connect dots as far as opportunities. Um, and I was actually at a conference that was being run by my partner that had a joint venture of that media company I spoke about earlier. And uh, it's funny, my mom sits at the center of a lot of things in my life, obviously, because she's my mother, but uh, she was speaking there, I believe. And one of the what would become my co-founders in Coin Firm came up to her and was like, hey, we have this idea. Because she talks a lot about you know young Polish entrepreneurs and helping them or whatever. And uh, she goes, you know what, that, that sounds crypto or whatever. That sounds more like something for Grant. 
So uh, she set up a meeting later in the day. I remember, you know, it quite vividly walking in, you know, seeing them for the first time. So uh, I got introduced to two of them of what would become the five original co-founders of the company. Um, and kind of told me, I said, okay, it sounds interesting. I see it. Let's hear more. Uh, and then there's follow-up meeting where, you know, I just started going in on the deck, um, uh, like the actual presentation deck, you know, the name I, I like to, you know, get really active right away. So, and, and just, just kind of started from there, you know, and the beginning of coin firm is, you know, that true brick and mortar startup story where, you know, our CTO and I were carrying these hundred kilo servers upstairs ourselves. You know, he laid down the cement himself in the first office. Um, so, you know, it's definitely one of the proudest accomplishments of my life. And once again, is proof of, you know, that, that, that mission can be done. You know, we started with nothing and, you know, now we're dozens and dozens and dozens of people in the company. You know, we have big office. We're known around the world. We got offices around the world. So, how many offices? Uh, now it depends on also what you count as office. But you know, we have we have two in Poland. We have the headquarter, which is London. So here's the flip on the game. Like you can do great ventures out of here, but don't red don't make them Polish ventures. Generally, there's no benefit. Uh, we have a U.S. spot and a Tokyo. Wow. So yeah, I think we're working on some other ones as well. But um, so yeah, it's 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 been a great ride, you know, around five over five years now. And also, most people know Coin Firm by the deal with the Peko Bank Polski. Yeah, in Poland, that's that's what we're most known for, uh, probably. Um, which uh, for those who don't know, PKOBP is uh, the largest bank in Central Europe. Um, and we integrated one of our products into it called True Datum. It's pretty much a data provenance type of solution built on blockchain and integrated that into PKOBP. They, you know, they sent over 7 million Polish people, got documents that were digital documents that were registered through our, our solution. And I think it stands still as one of the largest like true blockchain integrations in banking. So, you know, that's a, that's a proud thing for us, but that's not even our main product. Our main product is, you know, the analytics and the AML platform. Uh, you know, which we service anyone from, you know, Binance to financial institutions around the world. So uh, do you want to give us a somehow um, a, a case of how the AML works with the blockchain? Well, I mean, I, you know, AML is extremely important, but it's like something that people just don't really know. Um, so AML stands for anti money laundering. Uh, these are regulatory requirements that are placed on financial institutions, pretty much any business who's custodying, moving money, et cetera, or value of any kind. So crypto exchanges now uh, fall under you know, those sort of regulations. Um, but in the traditional space, so in the traditional banking industry, et cetera, it's a joke. It's under 2% effectiveness. It's extremely uh, labor-heavy very costly, not automated. Uh, so it's inefficient, ineffective. 2%. 2%. And that's kind of a good day. Um, so it's basically, it's not working. I mean, no, it's like I said, it's kind of a show. Um, and because of the innate qualities of, of how blockchain is, if you know how to analyze it, apply certain, you know, kind of risk algorithms to it, etc., uh, you can flip that. So at CoinFirm, we're doing we're in the ninety percentiles of effectiveness. It's a near automated solution. So anyone from one person company to you know the biggest bank in the world has a solution in their hands, A to Z sort of AML solution around blockchain assets and and crypto. And you know this is important for a lot of things. And this is why you know. Uh, a lot of people think, you know, that regulations are anti-competitive and, and a lot of incumbents like them because it makes the, you know, this barrier of entry and success uh, from competition, especially startups, small, small innovative players, really, really hard. If you have to hire 10 people, you have all this overhead, right, um, <coughs> around it. <coughs> so it's important for us to... Uh, and you're going to hear me use this later with Copernic space, is democratize AML, right? So now, like I said, that one player, that little startup 
can do something that the financial institution is doing. Um, so yeah, that's kind of from the AML end, but you know, there's a whole background on it. If you understand blockchain and the forensic stuff is, is amazing. So, you know, we have a project called reclaim crypto, which uses our tools to help reclaim the, it's probably near $20 billion in stolen crypto that's around the world. So it's, it's actually kind of fascinating and, and AML is actually kind of cooler and sexier than people think, you know, you are dealing with really interesting cases and hacks and stuff like that. So um, it's, it's not what I come out of, but it's something that I've grown into, let's say. From a transparency point of view, mm -hmm. between a fiat and crypto, which one do you think is more transparent? Yeah, was, you know, you know my answer to that. Um, obviously for, uh, the listeners and viewers, there's no, there's no comparison, right? The whole, um, one of the beauties of, well, it also depends on what blockchain you're talking about. You know, we need to specify that for, for viewers. It's like, but let's go with you know the biggest one the original which is bitcoin's blockchain it's it's the most traceable immutable transparent uh financial system let's say and uh store of value ever so uh you know you can see every transaction that ever happened right in a public ledger that everyone can technically go and see. So comparing that to, you know, how many dollars are in circulation, how many dollars are created, how much is the Fed printing, there's no comparison. Uh, it's, it's definitely a superior uh, world and model than the traditional financial one, which has become, you know, a Frankenstein of, of stuff. I think actually a lot of, you know, you, you meet these and you see these kind of, you know, these super smart financial guys and they just can't wrap their heads around Bitcoin or why has value or anything like that. And I think that's partially because the financial system and all things related is just so warped and so overcomplicated uh, that they don't get something as simple as r really simple as Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin is absolutely a simple idea to me. Do you want to say what Bitcoin is? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> like yesterday. That I was, was the shortest answer. Yes, yesterday I was, I was on a panel with Nigeria Fintech Week and, you know, I was the only guy on the panel. It was about blockchain and space, but I was the only guy on the panel, I think, that uh, actually like has a company in the blockchain space or anything like that. So the the moderator asked me, okay, so why don't you tell the listen to viewers what is blockchain, right? It's like, it's like, I hate those questions because it's like, now, you know, tell me what is the internet, you know, define the internet for me, right? It's such a hard thing to do. Um, but a around the Bitcoin thing, you know, the fundamentals, I can just lay down the fundamentals that helps uh, relate to what I just said, which is um, all this stuff is set in code, Uh to change anything in that code or any of the rules uh, or values of Bitcoin's blockchain, you need mass consensus. This is why, you know, we spoke about this before. This is why I call it like the U.S. Constitution of Digital Value, right? Because it has set rules that you can only change through mass consent, you know, heavy consensus and really a lot of a lot of effort. Um, so, um, and people have heard of Bitcoin miners, right? At the end of the day, what Bitcoin miners are, they're, they're entities that are applying huge amounts of computing power to solve problems that actually serve to verify transactions and then place them in the blockchain as blocks. That's where we get that from, right? And as a reward for this, uh, miners receive Bitcoin. So that's technically the, the generation. That's how Bitcoin's generated. And uh, this is all very well thought out. So it's anti-inflationary and only 21 million will ever be created. So you have a limited supply. You have encoded in it uh, strict limitations on how it's created and released. So logically, if people find value in it, believe in the value in it and transact with it, it will only grow in worth long term over time right? Because it has these core fundamentals in it. The US dollar doesn't have a cap, right? They can print however many they want tomorrow. And that's our money. You know, that's hurting our buying power, all these sort of things. So um, 
you know, that's why a lot of people are extremely passionate and ideological about Bitcoin. And you have Bitcoin maximalists, which they, you know, their thing is fuck all their crypto. It's they're all shit coins except for Bitcoin. Right. Um, so that's partly why you have it, because people believe truly that it is um, the next. It is, the, you know, what the financial system should be. One of the things that really destroyed the image of Bitcoin was the Silk Road. Yeah. And uh, there was a lot of conspiracy and everything around it that why it happened and uh, what happened to it in the end because everything was always in the dark web and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, yesterday, there was this massive news about the USC's more than $1 billion in Silk Road linked Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And that also brings back the whole information that I think it's like eight years since the Silk Road is uh, shut down or nine, maybe something like that. And still, there is one billion dollar worth of Bitcoin in circulation. Talking about anti money laundering, I didn't. I didn't read enough about. I knew that happened. I knew that a billion dollars moved from a Silk Road related wallet. Uh, I haven't read uh, really deeply into it. My guess is that that's just the U.S. government already had that, had possession of that wallet, and they're just moving it. That's my guess. I mean, you know, the cool thing about CoinFirm is, you know, I could just call my call someone in data science and, well, actually, I could do it myself on the computer right now. I, if you gave me the, the address, I'd put in the system, I'd forensically show how it's moving, where it's moving, et cetera. I uh, know, of course, in an AML risk report from our system, it would, of course, be flagged as related to the Silk Road and it would be high risk, et cetera. But uh, is it Imperial? I forgot which college in London it is. Uh, I went to it. They have a, like, crypto department. And actually, one of the things you see there is uh, they have this wall, which has the full visualization of, I think, the, the Silk Road. Uh, full visualization of Silk Road of the seizure of the money like and where mm -hmm. it's moving because they auctioned a bunch off too I think Tim Draper bought a load of the auctioned off Silk Road coins I could be mistaken though mm -hmm. um, but yeah that that happened that stuff's happening you know all the time in the background there's loads there's billions and billions of dollars in value being moved you know and you can see it Right. We would, you know, you made an important point there, actually, that I just now got the point that you were kind of making with it, which, you know, we would have never known if it was like, you know, Pablo Escobar's a billion dollars out of Pablo Escobar's, you know, accounts was moved by the federal government yesterday. We wouldn't be able to know that. All you got to do is monitor the blockchain and you see that movement. Right. So there's even a Twitter uh, account really famous called Whale Alert. Um where, you know, anytime any big transactions happen, they, they put it up. I mean, comparing it to the fiat, I mean, even if you think about uh, the serial numbers that are on the uh, banknotes, mm -hmm. still they burn some of them after a specific amount of time. And I, I still don't know exactly how this whole situation happens. I think this, um, um, uh, what was the name? This uh, uh, Spanish uh, TV series on um, Netflix, uh, Casa de Papel, like that was mainly talking about how easy it is that uh, you can even manipulate the the whole minting and the situation. And this is still is fascinating for me that is Bitcoin and blockchain only things that can be somehow used, uh, you know, like by immutability and by transparency, or the countries can also try to change their normal currencies and try to make it more into digital. Well, China's doing that, but. You know, and that's not going to be applied in the way that I think people hope. You know, it's my thing around, you know, some of these kind of hardcore ideological crypto people who are all about, you know, privacy, etc. It's like, well, you do understand you're pushing and promoting a techno technology that's, you know, a financial system that's totally transparent, right? You want, it's like one of these things of wanting transparency on everybody but yourself, right? But the government is definitely one where there should be, right? And uh, so China's doing their their digital. Uh, it's pretty much it seems to be just pretty much a stable coin. But they're going to put everything on that, and they're going to monitor and know everything all the time. In one place, is it democratic? I, I don't. 
Is it the, f the fact that the government would basically just, you know, I can no, see everything? No, like, it's the worst Orwellian idea in, in, in the world, kind of. I mean, nothing is 100% good. Nothing. So, you know, if we were to put the US, put the dollar on blockchain, sure, there would be lots of benefits, transparency. But also, the government knows better you. Yeah. So, uh... It's going to be a nice balancing act. You remember the big promises of the internet? You know, the internet was going to democratize everything. Yeah. That's not what happened. And, you know, crypto came on. Crypto's going to democratize. Uh, it helps. But it also, you know, you saw it happen in, in crypto, like wealth centralized. You know, people do that. We're tribal. We're central creatures. So... Um, a lot of the promises, uh, just like with the internet, a lot of the promises aren't going to come to fruition, and they're they're going to be gray, just like this Chinese, you know, stablecoin thing. That's How is the situation gray. in Poland? In what? Uh, regarding the whole uh, cryptocurrencies, blockchain development. I, I know that definitely you did a very I, big project yeah, here, but Poland, uh, Poland lost its big opportunity in that space, in my opinion. I think a few years ago it had a massive opportunity to lead. Uh, from a regulatory perspective, you know, from an openness aspect. Poland's kind of weird in that sense because it's not small enough to where it can act like uh, Estonia or something like that and just, like, make these really progressive sort of things, decisions really quickly. Uh, but it's not big enough to not do it, right? So um, I think it lost its its boat and uh, almost all the good crypto. We're not like CoinFirm's not like a crypto company in the sense of, you know, we're, we don't deal with trans. We don't do crypto transactions. We're not an exchange, etc. Um, but pretty much all the good businesses ran out of the jurisdiction. They might operate here, like their people are here and they're working here, but the jurisdiction of the company isn't here. Um, Poland was extremely progressive, one of the most mature markets when it comes to crypto. I was doing stuff, you know, here five years ago with crypto that still in most countries they can't imagine us doing it. Like, you know, going, getting a code on my phone, going to an ATM, typing in the code, getting Polish Zwalta out. But really the money was originally Bitcoin that was sent, right? Stuff like that. So, uh, it's unfortunate but Polish entrepreneurs, you know, need to do it privately themselves. And, and, you know, the saddest thing is, is I don't think, I don't think the government has given entrepreneurs a good field to play in here. What about the ICOs? Because uh, you guys also did your own ICO. And right now we don't see it at least as much and as often. So first of all, if you can, um, you know, like very briefly say what is an ICO and then like, uh, how does it work? Uh, ICO stands for Initial Coin Offering. Uh, uh, we did a token sale for AMLT, which is a uh, a network and a system that we built that um, not only allows um, the global crypto market or anyone to submit data uh, for rewards into our system, but also we just came out with uh, an oracle for it, which means that we can service, we can provide AML to DeFi, which is decentralized finance. So these are, you know, financial application services that uh, are decentralized, right? So if there's no central authority deciding what transactions can be approved or rejected, et cetera, uh, then you need some sort of automated decentralized solution for it, right? Um, so back to the point, uh, ICO stands for initial coin offering, uh, to be honest, 90 something percent of those ICOs were garbage. Uh, there was a lot of also scams and fraud involved. Um, but a good token project and token sale, uh, which, you know, ours was, uh, provides, okay, I'm going to simplify it. Pretty much what ICOs were is people would put their projects that they want to execute publicly, say how much funding they needed. And this was really one of crypto, especially Ethereum's killer application so far, is that uh, 
then you could open that project up for funding to almost anybody in the world globally. And they could securely send in crypto onto you, you know, your, your wallet or your smart contract address of your token sale. Um, uh, and in return, uh, they would get, you know, your tokens. And these tokens were supposed to serve some sort of function uh, on your product service that you were going to create or had already created using that money. Right. Um, so, for example, with AMLT, the utility was, uh, and and this is important that I say utility because utility tokens, right? And then you have security tokens, which we can get into that in a sec. Uh, majority of these ICOs were actually, uh, they were technically trying to sell a security because the token they were offering had no utility. So our utility for AMLT was provide as valid data. We give you the token back, use that token then for our AML platform and all these other services that we have, right? Um, so that's an example of like a real token sale and a real utility token. Um, you know, and there's countless other examples, right, uh, of these models. Then you had what, what are security tokens. This environment, the regulatory environment, isn't done around this cooked yet. Uh, so the ICOs, because there was so much, it was pretty uncontrolled for the most part, uh, that's pretty much dead. Like ICOs generally don't happen so much anymore. Um, but that might come back with vengeance in STOs, which are security token offerings. So instead of those tokens uh, having some sort of utility, they're directly related to shares of a company. So it's like traditional invest startup investing, just tokenized and more open and kind of democratized, right? Um, but I think that that STO thing is going to be great. And, you know, we're going to talk probably around the Kopernik thing. We'll, we'll speak a little bit more about it. But most of those ICOs, like I said, were either garbage or they didn't weren't really utility tokens and they were just selling, you know, pretty much investment in their project. As you dig deep into the utilities and security token, maybe it's good also to mention what, what is the difference and, uh, you know, like which uh, tokens are going to fit into utility and security. Well, I, I felt I kind of explained that in the sense of, you know, utility tokens serve a function, right? So I have a token, I can then use this token to uh, use some sort of feature on a platform, right? Or it has some sort of functionality. Whereas a security token just literally relates to ownership equity in a company project, etc. right? The cool stuff about that is like, uh, you know, not only does it kind of open it up to the world more, but um, it provides a lot more flexibility uh, when it comes to transfer of shares. Also, you know, ownership of shares. Like people ask, why can't I transfer my shares of McDonald's to my grandma right now? Why can't I just send it to her? Right. So it's going to be fascinating in the next couple of years. And, and Copernic Space, you know, one of its layers is to, you know, help push that, that aspect, but do so in a proper regulated manner. I think that's a very good segue. So uh, we digged, I think, you know, uh, deep enough into the whole conversation around the blockchain. And I'm sure that it still is not going to go that far, uh, you know, like in a different topic. But uh, let's uh, start with uh, the Copernic and then first say what exactly you're doing around the space industry. And then we can try to specifically talk about your project. Sure. Yeah, well, Copernic space is the history of it starts with my grandfather, actually. So my grandfather uh, was a professor around aerospace aspects for uh, the military um, academy here in Poland. Um, so the Air Force pretty much, right? Uh, and that's always sit in, in our family. My, my mother picked it up, you know, as well. So actually I think one of her biggest accounts ever when she was in Silicon Valley and doing, tech biz dev and sales and stuff at, at HP, I think one of her biggest accounts ever actually was Boeing. Um, but she's always been involved in some manner uh, around space. Um, even in the 90s here in Poland, uh, you know, she would try to do certain things around it. But either way, she's been in involved in it for, for a long time. Her and I also years ago created the Lady Rocket Foundation, which is a foundation that provides kind of uh, 
uh, entrepreneurial and space education and experiences to underprivileged youth. Uh, we've done it all over the world, uh, from Lithuania to to Lompoc, California, where most NASA and SpaceX rockets are shot up. Um, and we've been around, you know, these kind of space activities environment for a while, and we um, we noticed, you know, big issues which and holes, which usually means also big opportunities and and opportunities to do something good as well and, and create some positive change in the market. So. We saw we saw this issue of you got this industry worth hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, you know, we're in the internet age. You know, every industry pretty much has easy kind of marketplaces and things like that. And um, space doesn't, especially downstream. So downstream is, uh, for example, satellite data, imagery, et cetera. These are, you know, this is the data and the stuff that's fueling, you know, the, these computers, you know, I, Micro, I think a lot of original, you know, modern microphone technology even comes out of space applications, right? But either way, um, there's billions and billions and billions of dollars in value that's not being used. And one of the main reasons is, is because there's no easy way to interact and engage and acquire it. Um, space is unique also in the sense there's lots of rights involved. Security is extremely important. Um, and, you know, the the odd, full auditability of blockchain and, and all these other characteristics of it uh, are really conducive to, to the space industry. Um, so there's lots of really cool applications of this technology in the space industry. Uh, we're focused on providing a commercial marketplace, a digital marketplace for uh, space companies, but not just so entities within the industry can can uh, transact with each other, engage with each other, but most importantly, so the rest of the world has an easy place to come and take advantage of this. I mean, there's a study where in Australia alone, there's over 1.4 million companies that could take advantage of downstream space. 1.4 million companies. companies uh, downstream space applications, what we call in Copernic space, digital space assets. Um. So that's just one country, and that shows the potential of that, right? So, you know, just a use case that's, that's kind of cool that we're working on uh, with, with a company called Humbitech um, is uh, companies generate satellite data, right? The satellite companies. Um, rarely is that data, that, they jet, that raw data, the actual data that's used at the end by the end user, Right. There's usually an entity somewhere there that's let's say analyzing, structuring, and packaging it. Some of these satellite companies are now doing this themselves because they realize that, you know, there's there's a middleman kind of between their end purchaser. But um, so satellite satellite company generates data, it provides it to this entity. This entity in this case would be this Humbatech. Right? Humbatech packages it and then later down the line provides it to farmers, farming companies, and the government in Angola to help with agriculture yield. Right? So you have this chain that's that's happening right here. And Copernic Space is the marketplace and the platform where these entities meet and transact and transfer the rights and the value with each other. Right? Um, that's one layer of it. The other struggle that exists in in space industry, which is a little broader, not just focused on downstream, is uh, financing, funding. Uh, very narrow avenues for these companies. There's a few VCs focused on it, a few angels, uh, but it's really hard with startup capital, seed capital. Uh, the tickets, you know, the VCs are focused on big tickets. They're more focused on upstream, which is you know shooting the rockets and and stuff like that. You know, SpaceX, etc. Um, and then there's government, right? That gives funding, R and D funding, et cetera. Um, so taking, you know, my experience, not just from the ICO end, but also the regulatory end, uh, there's a layer on the Copernic marketplace called smart fund where these entities and projects, whether it's R and D research, whether it's charitable or whether it's investment in a company, uh, that they can onboard themselves there and open themselves up to financing uh, in the world. And, you know, NASA is actually the cool, coolest kind of case around all this stuff for both sides, the marketplace and the smart fund. Uh, 
because they have billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars in these digital space assets that they want to commercialize and provide better to the public. So there's that end. But also, you know, NASA is dependent on Congress to for all of its budget, right? Um, you know, this is a long road. You'd have to change kind of the laws. But, you know, our dream is, is that when NASA has a budget shortfall for a project, $100 million or something like that, whatever, that they can onboard it, do a campaign, you know, and get the American public to fund it. I, I have almost no doubt in my mind that the American public would happily – you know, throw a couple dollars to a space project that they that they like, and and you know the what the ICO boom proved is that people are hungry to engage with startups and and innovative stuff. And space to me is the most universally liked thing. I mean, that and music. I mean, have you ever met someone? And you're like, hey, so you know, yeah, screw space. I don't, I don't like space. <laughs> So um, yeah, I think it's Especially it's a in trillion the time dollar opportunity. Yeah. Everybody likes to have a space yeah. around them. So. Well, well, I think it's I think it's a trillion dollar opportunity, mm -hmm. uh, literally. One thing I really like about what you said is uh, like kind of a pun intended. Like you're kind of bringing space closer to people. Yeah, yeah. And, and democratizing uh, space. Yeah, but not only democratizing. Like I don't think everybody would understand how much their life is somehow in, um, affected, connected, yeah, yeah. and affected by space. Yeah, yeah. Like a lot of people who just say that, oh, I don't. Why are we just talking about a space? They don't take a look at their phone and see where their signal is coming from. Yeah, I, it's, I had a discussion with someone recently. They're like, oh, we need to stop. You know worrying about all the space stuff and we need to fix, you know, I think it was some, some topic about, you know, environmentalism and green and all this sort of stuff. And, and I get people's points around that, but to your point, I don't think they understand how, how much, whatever we do up there r relates to everything happening down, down here and how really, who knows if you want to save the environment or something like that, how that solution might come actually from up there. And as a person who is somehow trying to have a marketplace for a space industry, um, which one of these uh, projects is somehow is the most inspiring and interesting in your opinion? Uh, projects involved with Copernic Space, like that would be on the marketplace? And um, let's just say, first of all, in general. And of course, if something would be also related to Copernic. I'm hyper-focused on, you know, Copernic Space. So uh, I'm going to, you know, one project that's going to go on the smart fund uh, is focused on solving the issue of reproduction in space. <laughs> so if, you know, all the, it's, it's funny, there's all these people that are really into, you know, yeah, we want to be on Mars and all this stuff, but I don't think they've thought really about the millions of in, things that, that, you know, have to happen for that to happen. <laughs> and one of them is, yo, know, how do you, have and sustain, you know, children in, in space. So, uh, that's a really cool project. I'm not smart enough to know or comment on really what they're doing. Um, but that's Where is gonna, it based in, um, uh, he's, uh, he's Dutch. Okay. The main guy is, is Dutch. And I believe, I believe it's a Dutch project. Um, but, uh, I think that just, you know, it shows how broad, this is so that's going to be one of the the first projects on the smart fund when it when it launches right so and those those entities you know they rely on government and crazy billionaires those type of companies right that's all they can get their funding but i think if you know if 10 million people knew that there's a project around that eh, i'll give it 5 bucks i'm just wondering do you really believe that we're going to be in, on Mars? Do you think that uh, Elon Musk is going to bring us all the way? Do I think we'll get to Mars? Yes. Yes, I think we'll get to Mars. Do Do I think we're going to colonize it? I don't. Not likely for me. Um, it's weird, you know, because I'm in space. I'm in the space, you know, segment or whatever. But I'm kind of like the most depressing guy you can meet <laughs> when it comes to that stuff. Because, you know, just like I said, we haven't we're, we haven't figured out fundamental things. Can we do it? Sure, uh, it's possible. How long is that going to take? I have no idea. I don't think it's anything we're close to. Um, you know, we haven't figured out lots of things. You know, how is the human body sustain? I mean, if you look into it, just look at how hard, how badly an astronaut is affected by limited time and space. How his body starts deteriorating, his organs start, you know, going crazy. I have one kidney. 
you know, and like I wouldn't, I wouldn't survive Jack in space, right? Not long. So, uh, to answer your question, do I think that stuff's possible? Yes. Do I think it's realistic in any near term sense? No. One of the things I really like about uh, living between different planets is the time. Because uh, talking about relativity and uh, the understanding of time, mm-hmm. even if you are on the top of a hill or if you are below the hill, time changes in a different uh, time zone, let's just say, in a different, uh, different time than the other person. Mm-hmm. And now imagine that if we are going to really between, if you are going to live between different planets, then our birth date is not really going to have a meaning. Yeah. Once again, you're proving the point. There's lots of things that we need to figure out uh, before any of these. It's like, how old are you? And I'm just like, and which planet are we talking about? <laughs> right, right. Well, I guess I think we'll always revert to Earth years. Okay. My guess that is what's going to be the the standard. Do you is. believe it's still we're just going to be in the year 2020? What do you mean? Uh, aren't we just going to find another, like Elon Musk's birthday and then we're just going to have like, you know, like a before Elon and after oh, Elon? Oh, mean like a Jesus Christ sort of situation? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Maybe. We'll see. I, uh, I, uh, I have a weird thing where, you know, religion isn't less popular. I just think people have input their religious fervor into different things. You know, I think I think certain environmentalists treat it like a religion. I think certain, you know, vegans treat it like a religion. I think you know certain Bitcoin people treat it like a religion. Like it's it's um, so they have such an emotional tie to it. So I don't think it's anything crazy to think that someone will come along, probably a celebrity, that of some kind that you know could. Who knows? I don't know. I'm gonna ask you a question, and then I'm just gonna go back to the first uh, point that you mentioned. Um, it's a hypothetical, right? Oh, yeah. So if you want to just find a new point for the time, and that's going to be the year zero, mm-hmm. which person or which incident do you think is going to be the the time that is going to somehow define us that this is before and after? Is it going to be the birth of internet? Is it going to be blockchain? Is it going to be Elon Musk? Who, who or what can be really that point? Cloning? Cloning. Okay. I guess that could be one. That totally changes the game, doesn't it? Uh, How far are we from cloning? Humans? Yes. Um, I think a lot of the... I, I'm not an expert in this at all whatsoever. But my guess is a lot of the barriers are, are more uh, ethical and uh, regulatory and legal. So, uh, But my guess is once you can start willy-nilly reproducing organs and and people i think back to your you know kind of what's a birthday you know yeah so i guess maybe that would be the next it's funny in in the 90s and the early 2000s cloning was all the rage as a topic that's totally died down in the past 15 years no one i don't think anyone really talks about cloning i mean uh the funny thing is always like Hollywood and some other, uh, let's just say, um, um, entertaining uh, topics somehow really define topics. You remember like when I think it was Collateral Damage with Arnold Schwarzenegger that was talking about, uh, you know, like him cloning himself. Um, sometimes these things really bring a lot of information. You just, back and you just touched on something really important, which is actually kind of my mother's agenda and focus, which is... Uh, popularizing space, you know, wanting kids to get involved in space, become entrepreneurs in space. Uh, She believes that the best way to do that is through entertainment, culture, music, fashion. So like one thing that we do together, we create, you know, space fashion, right? So you've seen some of it uh, before. So back to what you're saying, it's like, yeah, you're totally right. Uh, Media, entertainment drives culture in in so many ways and that includes i mean remember how everyone was in the space in the 60s and you know media was pushing that yeah right so um and you know in the past what 10 years there's been a bunch of highly successful space related movies and this all really i think there's it's an amazing time right now for the space economy i don't like the term space industry i like the term space economy cuz i just showed you that's it's a whole chain of economy right exactly 
Uh, uh, and, and that could be partially because of what you said and, you know, mix, mix it up with kind of Elon's unique capability, I think, uh, to, uh, he kind of has what I kind of call awkward marketing, <laughs> like his, you know, something that, you know, Trump was very good at, you know, this kind of awkward marketing. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely. Yes. To answer your question. You had a very interesting uh, interview with uh, Jordan Peterson that was somehow, let's just say, I'm, why, why am I going there? Because first of all, we talk about blockchain. And at the same time, one thing that uh, makes him a bit different than a lot of other speakers is that he always have this religiosity while talking about psychology and a lot of other topics. So first of all, maybe you can try to explain how did you manage to you know, like have that interview? And at the same time, what was the exact topic that you were discussing? Well, I, I knew um, of him. Mm, before he got, you know, super famous. Uh, He's Canadian, right? Yeah, so I, I knew him because of the Bill C-16 thing that was happening in Canada, mm -hmm. uh, which passed with no opposition. Um, and I just reached out to him. I thought, I thought he was... I thought he had a very unique way of, of speaking about things, and he understood technology... And crypto is very, as I said, ideological in a lot of ways. And he, you know, a lot of his focus around psych is, you know, ideological, whether that's religion or, or political systems like communism and fascism. So I thought, you know, if he'd be one of the more, I think, more interesting people you could just, that doesn't know a lot about it, um, to talk about it. Right. And, you know, he's he's an interesting guy. And almost every kind of if you ever see long form content with him where he's talking to people, he usually throws a couple like quotes that are kind of gems in there. And and in that one, he has a few of those, you know, because uh, if I remember, I'm probably going to butcher it. But he had one where it's, you know, I'm asking why don't you know, why don't people why do you think people don't jump into this crypto thing? So much considering how, you know, trust in the traditional financial systems really low right now and, you know, all those issues. He said pretty much because uh, uh, people usually aren't willing to jump into a new boat out of theirs, even if theirs is, you know, kind of busted up and ring because they don't know the nature of the new boat. They know the nature of this boat. They don't understand the nature of that boat. So, uh yeah, I just reached out and, you know, this is, like I said before, he was super famous. So it was still him and his wife managing, you know, their emails. <laughs> and he was like, and it was funny because I, I, I was like, hey, I just want to check back in. And, and he actually wrote in the, to his wife in the email response, yeah, please make sure that I do this. <laughs> it was really cute. You know, they seem to have a really cute relationship. Um, and yeah, I just, uh, I just set it up. Unfortunately, I had horrible Skype issues during it, and I've interviewed a bunch of people, uh, you know, celebrity status type people. You know, I've in, I've interviewed you know some people I really really you know admire like Royce the Five Nine since I'm a, you know a rapper, um, but I was really kind of nervous, and I think it was more of an uh, an intellectual nervousness. I don't I don't know how comfortable people are. Uh, speaking to people that they think are smarter than them, right? So I might have had subconsciously something like that, but it's an interesting interview. Uh, quality issues aside, with sound and and everything, like the video was so bad I couldn't because I video recorded it, but it was so bad I couldn't even put it up. Um, but it's an interesting talk. So anybody you know watching, listening, want to check it out? You know, you can go to the GB Savant YouTube page, and it's it's up there. Yeah, I mean. Uh we definitely would go there. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, like technically right now, this is especially the term, time of Corona, we are always having a problem because most of the stuff are happening in the video and you see somebody is kid is just jumping from the back and then somebody, you know, like just having a very important meeting and then there's an audio and a yeah, video I don't problem. Like this, uh, I don't like that whole, uh, that element of, you know, the Zoom, every, put everything on a Zoom call thing. <laughs> like I was just in this, in a... Uh, mastering studio for one of my songs before I came in here and and you know the mastering studio is kind of far and I hate going out there and he's like oh we can just you know do it do it online do a zoom I'm like no I'm not gonna do a mastering session over a zoom call man so uh, I think 
I hope that that all that stuff alleviates and people can can let's say be physical with each other again. You mentioned about your uh, mom's foundation, and I know that this is a really interesting idea. Maybe you can also try to elaborate a bit on that. Uh, yeah, so it's it's something like I said we created years ago. Uh, it's global initiative, so we've done stuff here in Poland, we've done stuff in Lithuania. Uh, but most of our activities in Southern California, specifically Lompoc, California, which I mentioned earlier, is where a lot of SpaceX and NASA rockets launch. I've gone there and watched launches. So in the few places, you know, you can just you got to you got to be in the know. But uh, Lompoc is interesting because it's a gold mine, but it's uh, it's economically depressed. Uh, and it has a lot of issues. Uh, a lot of them are political um, issues. Um, we've had actually some some not fun experiences there politically, and you start seeing why certain places work and why certain places don't. Uh, so we do a lot of work there. We've done work at Lompoc High School Boys and Girls Club. But at the end of the day, it comes back to kind of what I was talking about earlier, as far as like inspiring and uh, inspiring youth to become entre entrepreneurial and engaged around space by using entertainment, music, tech, things like that. So we've brought, you know, I, I come out of music, so we've brought like DJs from LA, you know, to go to Lompoc and go to the schools, interact with the kids. You know, we've done, we've done some uh, entrepreneurship programs with uh, the high school. So we do lots of really, really, uh, really cool stuff. I, you know, it's I get more nervous uh, speaking in front of the kids uh, than I do like going up on stage, you know, for a thousand people. So, and I think that says something emotionally about you know what's important to me, kind of. Oh, that's nice. Again, you give me a very good reason to have another segue to the music part of mm -hmm. your uh, life. So, when did that start? Uh, bu 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 my grandfather was a jazz percussionist and drummer. Jazz? Okay. He had his own band. I always forget what it was called. I should call my dad right now and ask him. <laughs> um, what time and is it now for him? He's six hours behind. Six hours behind. Oh, yeah, it's a little too early. Um, and I think a lot, a lot of things skip generations. So like my dad's super talented. Actually, he's more talented vocally than I am. Um, but that's because he trained it as a kid. Uh, but I think things skip generations a little bit. So my dad's not passionate about music like I am. Like music is, you know, almost everything to me. Like I'm always listening to something. I'm either listening to someone talk or I'm listening to music, right? <laughs> um so that kind of, I think that kind of skipped and, and I think I picked up where my grandfather, you know, left off and I think, you know, I never got to know him. He was really old when I was born and he, he died pretty much right after that. Uh, but my guess is that kind of my, my artistic personality and, and, and stuff is closer to him. I started probably when I was four years old. Interestingly, my mom is the one who kind of pushed the music in me, uh, originally, um, I don't have with a lot of musicians or like stand-up comedians or actors or you know even even uh you know a lot of the tech entrepreneurs like they are in their biographies they always talk well my house was always full of music <laughs> right or you know my mom used to put on Bill Cosby records right and that's what or uh you know my dad was a programmer or my dad's an engineer right so I always had I didn't have that sort of thing with music I didn't you know, there's a few songs that stand out from my childhood, but I didn't have a household like that. Um, but I started playing piano maybe four or five years old. I don't play it anymore. I don't know how to play the piano really uh, anymore. I got into string instruments. So I was in orchestra, played the viola for five years, four years. Wow. Uh, guitar is my chosen instrument. Uh, so I was really into kind of hard rock, kind of new metal stuff originally. I've always been in a rap though. I mean, in fourth grade, I, I performed Gangster's Paradise. 
Fourth grade. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that shows you where I am. So fourth grade, I did. So you didn't go Paradise. to Shakespeareans. You just went. Yeah, yeah. I went. I went straight into you know Coolio. Um, but I got to a point with with rock and orchestra. With orchestra, you know, classical music, people tell you not just tell you what to play, but how to play it. Um. So I, knowing me, I that's not for me. So eventually I quit. I got so frustrated. I literally left my viola in my locker and didn't go back. And this is with Carmel High School Symphony Orchestra. Um, and with the metal stuff, uh, I also got kind of burnt out with it in the sense of I understood that, A, communication was key to me. And the best music when it comes to communication and how far you can go with lyrics, et cetera, is hip hop. Uh, I also knew that I didn't like sound restrictions much. So once again, hip hop is the most sonically, you know, it's the most open, uh, music form as far as sound, you know, you can jazz, metal, electric, whatever you want, you can mix it in there. Um, so that drove me just from then on to just be pretty much what I'd say hip hop focus. But if you listen to, you know, my music, most of it is hard to genre define. So I, I call myself a genre bending. A genre bending. Genre bending artist. This one is not democratizing it. No, no, I'm not democratizing. Well, we'll get into that. <laughs> but um, uh, but yeah, so, you know, I'm I'm my own artist, you know, called GB Savant. Um, I've been releasing some new music actually over the past few weeks leading up to the elections for an album called The New American Dream. And uh, I love mixing what I do around tech with music. And remember, that's kind of how I got into blockchain originally. So uh, a lot of what I'm going to be doing around music in the next year and two uh, is actually going to be heavily tech related. Um, you know, whether it's uh, my next album, which is called Mr. Crypto, which is all going to be tokenized and we're going to be playing around with some models around that. Uh, to Mr. Crypto, the label, which I don't, I use the term label only so people understand the general form of what it will be. But, um, you know, it's the next era of kind of digital labels in the sense of where tech and tools focused uh, about providing that to artists in the industry. And once again, to the democratizing aspect, right? So we're not saying... Just like the crypto people are like, oh, we're here to kill banks. No, you're not here to kill banks. Uh, you know, we're not here to kill Spotify or anything like that, but provide artists and creators the tools that help incentivize their listeners, users from engaging directly with them on their digital properties and keeping much more and having a direct transfer of value chain with their, their listeners and users as opposed to a uh, centralized third party, right? Which is taking money pretty much out among other things. So, uh, yeah, I, you know, I mix the, I mix the tech stuff with the, the music as well, but that's, that's my biggest lifelong passion. Normally an artist, uh, out of a hundred percent, uh, of, uh, the money that comes from their art, how much they get in return? Uh, it depends on the platform. It depends on the model. Let's just say, for example, like you as an artist that, uh, you know, like uh, as, a, as, a, as a creator. I forgot what the number, what the exact numbers yeah. are right now. Is but it like 10%, 50%, No, no, 70%? It's, it's 70 around there. Okay. But it really, it depends what platform, what's the model, what kind of agreement do they have in the back contract? Do they have a label? Do they have a 360 deal with the label? That means anything they earn related to the artist's name and music, a percentage of it goes to the label, right? So if you sell t-shirts, la label gets a cut, right? Your, your Spotify streams, label gets a cut. So that's a very hard question to ask, but uh, <coughs> I'm a victim of this myself, which is uh, artists are inherently bad at monetizing themselves. So... Um, you know, I want to be able to provide uh, tools that that help them do that. So, and and give benefits to users as well. So I'm I'm also you know around this label. I'm working with some other companies. You know, one of them 
uh, is a streaming platform that not only you know provides a bigger cut to the creator, but uh, rewards users as well, right? So there's a mil million different ways to look at it, but the music thing is, like I said, is the the most consistent thing in my life. You you did a very interesting, uh, what do you call it? Like a a, a video, like a Music video? Music video, yes, thank you, yeah. <laughs> Such a sophisticated <laughs> yeah. word, it's like that's music. Is a, that's that, a tough one. Is that, is that what you guys call it these yeah. days? Yeah, real. Um, and that was about the corona. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not, yeah, you're talking about the coronavirus suit for the soul music video. Hey. We saw ourselves, grabbed everything that wouldn't melt. Hold your felts. That's not technically about Corona in a certain sense, but it's, uh, I think Corona has really exposed and highlighted uh, a lot of, a lot of ourselves in, in a bad way. What we're really like as people, uh, our, our narcissism, uh, you know, the, the propaganda aspect, you know, once COVID hit, you saw that ramp up and you see it extending, you know, now into the election. Right. Um, but the video itself was really funny and, yeah. and, and fun to film. I mean, the, the video is not funny when you watch it. It's actually kind of, <laughs> it's kind of has scary vibes, but, uh, it was funny doing it because, you know, I'm running around, uh, Warsaw you know, a major metropolitan city in pretty much just like a, you know, a kind of hospital gown <laughs> and a mask and, you know, a, a face mask, you know. Uh, and, you know, and I'm doing this, like I'm running across, you know, one of the major bridges here in the city and, and you know, cars are going by and they're looking at me all crazy. <laughs> I had to drink quite a bit before I did that one just because, you know, you got to get some liquid kind of courage and it was kind of cold too at that point, you know, and I'm barefoot. And so I'm, you know, my feet are torn up by the end of it because I'm <laughs> running on, you know, on cement, but it was, it was a really great experience. And I hope people, you know, like the, like the video and, and I'm going to be doing a lot more visual elements soon. What about the American nightmare? Yeah. All of these are part of the new American dream. So coronavirus suit for the soul. After that, recently I released brave new world. And then a couple of days ago, I released American nightmare on election day. Uh, yeah, uh, it all kind of serves into this. A lot of these songs actually were written years ago, but I kind of saw writing on the wall of everything that was happening. Mm, just like, you know, I, just like, you know, I kind of knew Jordan Peterson before most people knew Jordan Peterson because I'm, I'm into, the, let's say the, I'm into culture and, and how, how cultures act and, you know, and the politics and, you know, I come out of digital media, I, I've worked with some of these, what I would call propagandists. Um, so that whole project is just to kind of highlight that. And, and American Nightmares also, you know, it's all about really all this stuff. We're just really exposing who we are, like how how rotten we've become uh, as people. Like, you know, everybody wants to blame someone else, you know, and I think Trump's a funny example of that <laughs> in the sense of, you know, everything, you know, blame of, of something falling exclusively on one person is almost never the case, <laughs> let alone with, with such, such massive things. So, uh, yeah, American nightmare is exactly that. It's, you know, uh, we're kind of in a nightmare, uh, right now, but it's a self-imposed nightmare. We did it, you know, so it's, that album's kind of for us to put a big mirror in front of our face and look at ourselves. I mean, you're not an American, you know, no one in this, in this room uh, is an American but me. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's a global issue. It's just U.S. stands to lose the most and stands at the forefront of it. So let's just say um, we were supposed to expect something on the November 3rd. Now we're November 7th. And uh... Well, when we talked about this before, I told you that's not going to happen. You know, I think I think what I told you pretty much is what happened, which is, you know, uh, Trump is going to win election day voting. And he might you even still get, believe that Trump is going to win the election day voting. He 
election. Listen, specific words here. Election day voting. Uh, election day voting. Okay, okay. So when not, after not that day, ballots. all these mail-in ballots came in. Yeah. And uh, and that Biden will win out, but that Trump will actually win the election day. Uh, but now it looks like, you know, all that's going to go to court. And it should. I mean, I once again, I think we've exposed ourselves. And the good thing about stuff like this happening is if you expose things, you can fix them. Right? So obviously our election system isn't working very well. Anybody who says otherwise is, you know, Is crazy. it because of the electoral or you have another... No, electoral that... college is great. That's not the issue. The issue is, you know, it's a political issue. It's a cultural issue. What's going on right now? So you think even the fact that electoral sometimes in some states they can they can say that the popular or or the electoral and they can be decided or non decided. Yeah, but what, what you're the issue of what you're seeing now is this issue would exist in the pure democracy popular vote wouldn't change this issue. This issue is something deeper, um, and it's happening in a lot of places. Um, and our system's broken. But wasn't this a South problem of putting electorals, not to just put a direct democracy that people just vote it's, and then... It's to, it's to uh, eliminate, or it's to limit uh, influence and control by elite urban centers. So it gives a voice to small states and small smaller... But areas. Randall, like six states that they decide the whole election. So isn't that also the same answer? What do you mean six states decide the whole election? Isn't that, uh, oh my God, like, this, this is Wyoming, uh, uh, Texas, like... No, that's, that's a bunch of, I mean, to me it's bullshit and I think this election has proven a lot of that. For example, no one other than JFK and if you know anything about that election, it's widely considered that that was full of fraud and intimidation. Other than that election... Never in the entire history of the United States has someone won Florida and Ohio and lost. That's happening right now. So uh, something's happening. I don't know what exactly. Uh, you know, my, my dad and that side of the family for over 100 years is from Detroit, so in Michigan. Um, you know, no one's going to ever go outside of and say that, you know, the political scene in Detroit is not corrupt historically. But I don't know. Something's happening and and, and it needs to be looked at. And, is Michigan blue? Oh, historically? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what the, you know, uh, that used to be the Democratic stronghold. You had Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Ohio, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota. How did Arizona become... Blue. I don't know. I don't know enough about Arizona to be honest. Uh, it's. I think you're surprised by it because people think Arizona and they think you know, k kind of cowboy redneck stuff. <laughs> it's not. It's not really like what it's like. I mean, um, you know, the bigger shock would be seeing something like California go red, or maybe Texas. I mean, um, uh, Texas was close. Yeah, it was close, but We're also taking a look at think. Austin. And, Austin's and, very liberal. Uh, yeah, but uh, Dallas and like I think even two other cities, they were all blue. And that Dallas was, went blue? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, th that was mind boggling. I mean, like looking at like what where Texas was going and it was like, the, you know, this, pla the, this yeah, uh, these, place that know, was like, don't California my Texas. Yeah, well, I really feel that happened, you know? Because uh, it is happening. It is happening. And it's going to happen in Nashville. Right, it's gonna happen in Florida as well. You're gonna see certain districts in Florida because everyone from most people from LA, San Francisco, and New York are leaving, and they're going to the states and cities that they made fun of. Just to tell you specifically that I didn't make a mistake. So Dallas blue, uh, Fort Worth blue, uh, Austin blue, Houston blue. San Antonio blue. Yeah, <laughs> major cities in Texas all but, went but blue. But almost because. Major urban areas are almost always blue. Okay. Yeah. I'm 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 very surprised. But one thing that I would say I'm even more surprised is that um um Bernie Sanders had an interview like seven days ago, or like I would say a few days before the election. He said exact thing every single state what is going to happen. 
And even the fact of, I mean, even what we are discussing, you know, like talking back to what uh, um, uh, uh, Steve Jobs said about like, you always understand uh, how to, what the order of things are when you see them from the future to the past. Like maybe now we're a little bit more sober regarding our conversation and our prediction and it's far more accurate. But uh, take a look at, uh, I think it was Jimmy Fallon, the way that Bernie Sanders started talking about everything that is happening with that level of accuracy. I mean, I, of course, I know that he is a guy who is years in uh, politics, but that is a strange for me that all of these things that from at least from my layman point of view, like uh, it's such a surprising thing for a politician. It's so clear. Well, I think what's more surprising is is Bernie Sanders campaigning for supporting anything with the Democratic Party. Well, the reason I'm saying this is because they screwed him, you know last time around i mean this is they screwed him this time too there is a very interesting uh, argument that a lot of people are saying that a lot of people are not voting for biden they're voting for not trump and i think exclusively, that's exclusively almost yeah. and that's also kind of what is happening i think with the uh, you know have you ever seen a campaign run literally almost exclusively on how bad the other guy is I mean, I, I can definitely, you know, like uh, say it, but as you know, like, you know, like there are so many different elections and I'm not that much specialized in it. So I'm, I'm, I can relate. No, I'm, I'm just saying, like, I've never seen anything, anything like that where there's nothing, you know, there's nothing like, well, this is what I'm going to do. It's more of just like how horrible the other side is. But, but once again, that's back to our cultural issues. We're, we're totally incapable of, of speaking to the other side anymore. And it's, and social media has pushed that to such a level that I don't, I don't think most leftists have any right wing friends, and I don't think most right wingers have any leftist friends. Although it's a lot harder, I think, for the right wingers to ignore the leftists because it depends on where you work. But if you work in tech and media, you know you're not. You're not going to be able to ignore <laughs> leftists. I mean, look, uh, I, I really don't want to close it on uh, such a, let's just say, dark note. One of the things I really like, and that was like, few, I think it was like yesterday or two days ago, it was the Gwen Stefani and Blake Shelton's marriage. And uh, I, I know it's such a cliche and, you know, like something not uh, as profound as the other the things we're talking, but two super left and super right, you know, like uh, people just putting all the differences aside. Who's super right? Uh, I mean, Blake I mean, Shelton? He's a you know um, a country music guy. I mean, what do you think? This is a, people have funny, <laughs> funny, funny uh, kind of impressions. I was going to bring it up earlier when you were talking when we brought up the Arizona thing and then yeah. the Texas thing. It's like uh, the South isn't any isn't only you know rednecks. Okay, <laughs> and country music is. Uh, most people don't have never really even listened to country music. Okay. And like Blake Shelton, like real country fans, like they'll tell you that's pop country, that's fake country. And like those people are celebrities. They are, they think the same way Gwen Stefani thinks. They exist in the same realms as, uh, try to remember where uh, uh, Taylor Swift came out of, country pop. So those people are alike. If you would have told me Gwen Stefani and Hank Williams the <laughs> third, then I would I would be like, oh, that's that's interesting. <laughs> but those people are the, are the, they're all the same. Okay. I mean, I, I really wanted to have a turn of you know like being so you know like dark well, and oh, <laughs> then here's, no, American that's... nightmare, and then try to at least turn it into you know you know what's what I do see that's happening is. Uh, like, like left, left, the real left, because uh, Biden is fake left. He's not uh, like that at all. To be honest, Biden is actually probably more of a, uh, is probably more conservative uh, than maybe even Trump in a lot of ways. <laughs> but uh, what I have seen though is like the left, the real left, and the the real right, because uh, Fox News is not the right. You know, once again, they're like this center sort of thing. Uh, is that they hate each other, but they're starting to agree on points. So the left, you know, sees the same things in Biden that the right 
sees, right? For example. So either way, I, I have hope. I think the United States especially is very flexible. It can bend. It's very hard to break. Um, but if, if people stay in this kind of identity aggression thing, then, then we're going to, it's going to be hard. Okay. Look, uh, I, I know that we can talk hours and hours about that, but mm -hmm. I know that also your time is very limited. And, uh, first of all, I really want to say thank you for sure. giving us your time. You have a lot of different, different, uh, super interesting, uh, projects ahead. We make sure to put all the links, uh, for other people Please. to also follow that up. Just want to say thank you very much for your Thanks time for and uh, looking forward to seeing you in other opportunities. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you.